midway through our series. Has the series been a blessing to you? Yes? The Ways of the Warrior. And uh, so we're on part three today, part three, and so we're continuing in this. And so um, we haven't done this in a while, so let's welcome those that are watching by Facebook, YouTube, website, uh, mobile app. Y'all give me a hand clap. Welcome them that are watching. We love our extended family that, that watch online. And uh, we got people, I have no idea who they are watching. And so that's great. I love it when I see uh, people I have no idea who they are and they're just seeing our, our stuff. And so um, throughout this series, uh, we've been uh, learning the ways of the warrior. In week one, uh, we learned how to strategize, strategize like a warrior. And if y'all missed any of these messages, of course, you can go on the app and watch them, listen to them. And, uh, but we learned from the battle between David and Goliath in week one. And we learn to keep our focus, keep our distance, keep our evidence, amen, keep our evidence because another battle is coming. Come on, do you know that? Do you know, see, we, we, oh, I, I got past that battle. I guess the rest of my life is roses. Oh, ho, ho, you got another one coming. You better hold on to your evidence. What's that evidence for? It's not only to show the enemy that you won, but it's also to show yourself and to uh, encourage yourself. David, the Bible says this, David had to encourage himself in the Lord. And so I'm sure he took a look at that armor once in a while. I'm sure he remembered the days he was, he was uh, holding onto that head of Goliath. And so you got to encourage yourself. In week two, last week, we learned from the life of um, Joshua and how to shout like a warrior. Now, shout, of course, we weren't, we weren't all up in there going, ah! You know, running around, freedom, you know, like Mel Gibson and all that. But because shout isn't only about how loud you are, but it's about what you're believing, what you're saying. And so we learned that uh, how to shout like a warrior. We learned to have a shout of expectation instead of, of being intimidated. We learned to have a shout of confidence and not a shout of complaining. See, it's about what comes out of your mouth. It's about what comes out of your heart and out of your spirit. And so we also learn to have a shout of a victory, not the shout of a victim. You know, you, you have to be a victim to get victory, but my God, don't stay the victim. Don't continue on and keep being the victim. And so we've learned some things of the Warriors in the last couple of weeks over the last couple of messages. And, and so here's our theme scripture. We've read this every week, so let's read it again. In Psalms 144, 1 through 2, this is the NLT version. It says this. It's right above me. You can crack out your Bible, or you can use your mobile device, or you can just look right above me. Uh, we make this easy for you so you can take notes. Okay? Praise the Lord, who is my rock. He trains my hands for war. He gives my fingers skill for battle. He is my loving ally and my fortress my tower of safety. He's my rescuer. He's my shield, and I take refuge in him, and he makes the nations submit to me. Amen? He teaches me. He teaches me. Isn't that great that uh, the God, God doesn't just shove you out in life and say, handle it yourself? But he teaches us. See, God says, I train you for war. I train your fingers for battle. This isn't a one-time, God, no, oh, a battle's coming, I better train you. He's been training us since the beginning. He's been training us since we said, yes, Jesus, be Lord of my life and Lord, be Savior of my soul. You know, he's been training us. Thank God he doesn't just throw us through some quick training just to get to a battle. But he's not only training you before, he's training you during, and he's training you after. Because he knows that something else is coming. Amen? And so, today we're going to learn how to advance, advance like a warrior. Uh, what does uh, advance mean? Advance means this, to move forward. That's pretty obvious, but look at this. Progress in development. To accelerate in growth. So, so it's not only about taking a step. You know, we see this as this is advancement. This is advancement. We take a step, we've advanced. But there's more to it. Are you learning anything in your advancement? Are you growing in the steps that you've taken? So there's a lot more to advancement than just moving forward. Because there's a lot of people that move forward that haven't learned a thing, haven't grown an inch. There's people that have been in churches uh, the same church for all their life and haven't even learned how to pray on their own. They need everybody else to pray for them. 
They need everybody else to fast for them. They need everybody else to read Scripture to them. You know, this, you, you shouldn't come here uh, and this is all you get is me. Yeah, when's the last time you got into the Word? Well, pastor read the Scripture Sunday. What did you do Monday through Saturday? Did you learn anything on your own? Did you advance in the Word of God on your own? And so advancement means to move forward, progress in uh, and development. It is, it is impossible to advance without growing. You, you have to grow. You have to. It's a must. In your Christian walk, God expects growth. Growth is so important. We've even put it in our, our motto, our slogan. Remember last week we talked about this, our slogan, our, our great shout, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go back and watch the message. Our great shout, our slogan that says that uh, we have it up on the screen in case you don't know it. You should know it by now if you've been coming here for any amount of time. To connect people with Christ and strengthen them for everyday life. Strength is another way of saying that you're growing in some area of your life. If you've obtained strength, maybe you um, used to as a, a younger person, you had a hard time accepting criticism or correction or something like that. Now you've grown and you're, okay, please tell me what I did wrong so I can learn from it, so I can grow from it. See, that's, that's growth. That's advancement. That's strength. And so if we're going to learn from the ways of the warrior, we have to gain strength in areas in our life. In the book of Judges, we are introduced to a man, and he's the one we're going to be looking at here today, uh, by the name of Gideon. Gideon. At this time of Gideon's life, while, he was, uh, he, while we're in the Word here looking at Gideon, um, there were no kings ruling over the land. This was just the way things were. There were no kings. We see later on that the people, people start crying out and complaining and saying, we want a king. Everybody else has a king. Real mature, right? They got a king. They got a king. You get a king. You get a king. You get a king. And they were like, I want a king. And, and God was like, man, you're my people. Ain't I good enough for you? And the people were like, we want a king. And so whole nother story. But in this time, there was no kings in the land. And um, so we see in, in Judges 17, 6, we see this. In those days, Israel had no king. And the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Because when you have nobody ruling over you, you have nothing to give you boundaries. You have nothing to tell you you can't do this and you can't do it. It's just like that driving down the street. You might not have a cop or something directing traffic, but you've got these little lights that turn green, turn red, turn yellow, and we have it systematically within us that we stop on red, we go on green, and we press the gas on yellow. Amen? That's what we do. And so, you know, it's in us. We have learned through our life what those things mean. And so things give us boundaries. They, they show us how to live our life. But there was no king, and so the people, the Bible says, did whatever they wanted. It, it kind of goes back to the lyrical eyes things we were teaching about, how the satanic church, one of their mottos that they live by is do as thou wilt, do whatever you want. And so this was kind of, you know, this shows you right here that it wasn't, uh, they weren't living by the ways of God. They were living by the ways of the enemy, that they did whatever they seemed right, whatever seemed right in their own eyes. In other words, whatever they did, they justified it. Even today, we have rules and regulations, we have commandments, we have the Word of God, but still, people will do what they want and find a scripture to justify whatever they're doing and take it way out of context. And so, people want to do what they want to do. And so, because of this, the Bible says that the Lord handed over the people, the Israelites, because they were doing whatever they wanted to do, handed them over to the Midianites. For a total of seven years. Now, what does that mean? He handed them over. You know, it, it, that means that he um, took protection off of them, uh, removed his uh, anointing or favor from them, and allowed the enemy to come in and do whatever they wanted to do. And so, um, what the Midianites did for seven years was they came in once a year and they um, stripped 
the land of all of its crops. Everything that the, that the Israelites had been working for, for a year, when it came harvest time, the Midianites came in and either took it or destroyed it. All their hard work down the drain. Killed the animals, all the animals that they were raising for a year, whether it be donkeys or, or, or goats or sheep or whatever. They take what they want, they destroy all the rest. And so they here were leaving the children of God uh, hungry, destroyed, and just feeling like losers. But it was not God that we have to put the blame on. It's the Israelites because they chose to do whatever they wanted to do. In fact, the scripture starts out that um, they said they, they disobeyed God. They turned from his ways and went, um, another version will say, whoring after other gods. So doing whatever they wanted to do. And so God gave them over to the Midianites. They left them starving, scared, and destroyed. So the Israelites began to pray, just like we all do when we're in a situation and a problem, we pray. You know, we, we don't talk to God and we don't pray to God when everything's fine because we think, what's the, what's the use? Why talk to him? But when everything starts going downhill, that's when we start crying out to God. And so that's when the Israelites started to do. And God, in his faithfulness and love, answered them. He visited a, name, a man by the name of Gideon, and this is what he said to him in Judges 6, 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with strength, go with the strength you have, and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. I'm sending you. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of like Moses, when Moses cried out to God and said, Your people are are being destroyed. Your people have been under the thumb of the Egyptians. Your people are crying out to you. And God says, I will come deliver them by sending you. By sending you. See, whatever we cry out for is probably the very thing that God is asking us to change. If you have a heart for it, God is probably asking you to do something about it. He says, I'm sending you. And then Gideon says, but, 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 here we go again. I won't go back there like I did last week. But yeah, <laughs> y'all know, if y'all, y'all like, some of y'all are like, what, what? Go watch the message because I left it in. Oh, yes, I did. And so, you know, he says, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest. In other words, my people, uh, you know, the tribe that I'm in, you know, because you had the 12 tribes of, uh, of, of the people. And so here we have uh, one of the tribes. He says, my clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I, see, at first he's talking about everybody else. He, he says, all of us are weak, but I am the least of my entire family. The least. I'm the least of them. Now, whether that's saying he's the youngest or the scrawniest or the most intelligent, or the, the least intelligent, um, his relationship with God is not where it needs. I don't know what he's referring to as least, but whatever it is, he's not very confident in himself. And so I know what you're thinking. You're, you're like, Pastor, great job picking the warrior this week. Awesome job. You know, we talked about David. David was like, uh, how dare you? How dare you talk about my God? And he's going forward, and he's kicking a giant's butt, and he's cut, cutting his head off, and he, he's taking the head over to the Jebusites and saying, you're next, buddy. And, 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 you know, this is an awesome, this is a teenager, this is a kid that's aiming for the throne. Then we talk about Joshua. Joshua is the type of guy that was like, uh, how, how stupid can you be saying we can't attack right now? Let's go now. And he's saying, as for me in my house, these were some great warriors. Now we choose a warrior by the name of Gideon that says, I'm the weakest, I'm the least. You know, why did I even choose this guy? Because the majority of us want to be like David. All of us aspire to be like Joshua, but we have to start out like Gideon. See, because Gideon is a lot like all of us. We want change, but we don't know how to achieve it. We want something done, but we don't know how to get there. We want to see everybody else bring a move of God, but when it comes to us starting it, we say, I don't know how. But if we get to the place of just realizing that if all we do is just surrender to God, God starts the movement. 
God will bring the movement. You know, I, I don't like when people, well, I'll go, I'll go to that church when it gets bigger. <laughs> How do you think it's going to get bigger? By you coming to church, you know? And so, you know, I've had people tell me that. They say, you know, uh, um, uh, I was talking to somebody once, and, and I, I, I said, man, yeah, yeah, y'all are y'all welcome to come. And said, like, oh, we'll wait till you're about, you know, church unlimited size. And I was like, how do you, how do you think we're going to get there, you know? How, you know, we're not trying to compete with them, but how we do that is by, by you coming and being a part of it and being committed to it. It's not about how big the church is. It's about how much you want to worship your God. And you're coming in together with others to do that. And so um, we, ha- we have to start out like a Gideon. We have to start out even if we're not even confident in ourselves. Because remember, advancement in it isn't only about this. Let's remember, let's remind ourselves uh, the definition. It's not only to move forward, but it's to progress in development to accelerate growth, to accelerate growth. If you come here every single Sunday, and maybe on Wednesdays, I wish everybody would come on Wednesdays because y'all are missing some really good teaching by our teachers on Wednesday nights because they take what I teach and they, 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 they pluck out things that, that, that really touch them and then they express it the way they express it. Oh, it's powerful stuff. It's powerful stuff. So if you're missing Wednesday, if you're just not, well, the pastor's not preaching, oh, you're missing it. Because to get other perspectives and other personalities behind this pulpit to express the word of God is just priceless. And so advancement doesn't only come by this. Advancement comes by your growth. If you're coming here, I hope you're growing. I hope you're growing. I don't care how old you are. I hope something in you is growing. Amen? And so let's learn today. Let's learn how to advance like Gideon. Because Gideon started out, I'm the least, my clan is the weakest. If he's going to go forward and do what God's called him to do, there has to be some advancement and there has to be some growth. And I wouldn't pick him if there wasn't any. And so Gideon had some advancement within him, okay? And so number one, if you're taking notes, look at this. Gideon learned that advancement comes through maturity. Comes through maturity. We have to be growing in maturity in God. Let's look at his story here in Judges 6, 36. Because Gideon is not somebody that we hear a lot about, just like David or Moses or, you know, there's not whole books dedicated to them. Gideon is just one cog in the machine of the book of Judges. Because like we said, there was no kings. And so God began to handpick judges, hence the name of the book, Judges, that would help with the... um, affairs of the people as far as the laws and and uh, making decisions and and casting judgment and doing all this this is why these people were put in place and they were handpicked by God that's where we see Samson that's where we see Deborah that's where we see Gideon that's where we see there's so many there's about 12 to 13 different uh, judges found in the book of Judges so Gideon is just one person within that mix and so we only see him in about two or three chapters within the book of Judges. So starting in Judges 6.36, it says this, Then Gideon said to God, If you truly are going to use me, (laughs) has anybody ever asked that? Anybody ever had that kind of uh, um, mentality of, okay, I know God wants me to do this, but let's see if it's real. Let's see. And Because God was coming down saying, Look, you're going to uh, rescue the people. So he says, If, if, I'm really going to do this because prior to this he did this again he said he said if it's really you talking to me if it's really you talking to me and then he tells God uh, stay right there I'll be right back don't leave I really want to know that it's you and he takes off and goes to get a bunch of groceries from H-E-B and he he begins to put all this stuff together and then in the presence of God God um, basically consumes them you know, just chars them up and stuff. And so now he's like convinced it's God talking to him, but now he's asking if you're really going to use me. You, you would think that would have kind of answered his question. But he said, if you're truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. He said, I'll take a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, 
then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed out the fleece and he wrung out a whole bowl full of water. And so basically he said, God, look, I'm going to lay my sweater out, you know, my fleece sweater. And in the morning, I want the ground around it to be dry, but I want the sweater to be wet. And so he gets up the next morning, he wrings it out, bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, please don't be angry with me, <laughs> but I have one more request. I just, just need to make sure, you know, because, you know, I might have misunderstood. I might have, you know, this could have been an accident. And so this time, let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. So that night, God did as Gideon asked, and the fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered with dew, okay? And so um, Gideon had already admitted in the beginning, remember what we read a while ago, he, he already admitted to being the weak and the least in his family, but when God called him and addressed him, he called him this, he said, mighty warrior of valor, God is with you. He, he was validating what was in Gideon that he saw that Gideon had not yet recognized in himself. And on top of that, he said, I'm with you. And so just because you don't see what's in you, but I see what's in you, I know that you can do what I'm calling you to do. But just in case you still have a little doubt, know that I am with you. But even with him asking him and calling him that, Gideon still said, can you prove it to me? So I think, uh, I think God put up with it, tolerated Gideon for asking him for a sign so he could train him up in the faith, to train him up. But can I tell you, sooner or later, you need to put the fleece away and walk by faith. Amen? Because we find later on, if you read on through the Bible, and you'll find Jesus telling the people, Oh, you wicked nation, all you want is a sign. All you want is proof. When are you going to grow up and start believing me, O oh, mighty warrior of valor? I see what's in within you that you don't see yourself. If I can see what's in you without you knowing it, don't you think I can see the outcome with you even knowing it? I can do some things through you because I'll never leave you. Look at this. I wrote this down. True maturity in Christ is when we stop asking why do you want me to go and start asking when do you want me to go. Not why, but when. God, is it today or is it next week? I don't want to miss the green light. I don't want to miss when you, but I'm not asking you if you're, if you're, if you're uh, correct about this. I'm not asking if I'm misunderstanding. I know your voice by now. I know in the past I had to lay a fleece out, and I know in the past I had to ask you a couple of times, but I've advanced since then. I've grown since then. I've gotten some progress in me since then. Now I know without a shadow of a doubt that you're speaking to me. I just want to know when. When? Do you want me to go? And I'll do it without even asking a question. We need to stop living by the fleece and start living by the word of God. Here's one of my most favorite scriptures in the Bible. And uh, I, I have it in the message version because it's just so in your face. And I love stuff that's in your face. So I, I had to put this one in here in Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. It says, so come on, let's leave the preschool finger painting exercises on Christ and get on with the grand work of art. Grow up in Christ. The basic foundational truths are in place. Turning your back on salvation by self-help and turning in trust towards God and baptismal instructions, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. God helping us will stay true to all that, but there's so much more. Let's get on with it. Well, that's not saying we don't believe in these things. That's not saying we don't believe in salvation and we don't believe in baptism and we don't believe in all. We do believe in them, but my God, they're so basic. It should just be part of us and we should just realize that's what we do. 
So what else can we learn? You know, the, one of the most basic, fundamental teachings in the, in the church today, people can't wrap their hands around it. Tithing. It's so basic. It's so fundamental. But it's because it messes with people's wallets. Well, all that pastor wants is my money. No, no, no. Well, that, that, that. That's why I don't get up here and do the offering. Because I don't want anybody ever saying that I've asked you for a dime. It is in the word of God that we give out of obedience to our Father. And it's through that obedience God builds the church. Well, you're getting rich off of this. Trust me, I am not getting rich off of this. At all. Because that's not why I'm in this to do this. I love seeing what we've done here. And I can't wait to see what we do in the future. Notice I said we... Come on, we, we're doing this because I go on the app every Sunday morning like everybody else does, and I give my 10%. Now, our pay fluctuates week by week, so it's different every week, but we stay true to it. I don't ask you to do anything I don't do. I, d I do the same thing. I give, I, we give offerings, we give, it, it's, let's get past the fundamental thing. There are so many people that are so stuck on the fundamental things that people, I've known people in the past, they come up and they get saved every single Sunday. Every single Sunday. Oh, Jesus, come into my heart. I thought he came in last week. Did you kick him out? Door locked? What's up? You know, is in the, they get saved every single Sunday. I haven't seen that here. Praise God. I haven't seen that. My, when you know that you know that you're born again, that you're saved, that you got him living in your heart, you're not only uh, uh, talking about living in your heart, but you're following him. You're advancing. You're progressing. You're doing what God has called you to do, and that's be a disciple of him. So we need to grow up. There's so much more to it. Let's get with it. And I believe that's what God was doing in Gideon. He tolerated the fleece thing. Okay, yeah, sure, sure, we'll do this, shakalakalaka, and did it, you know, and squeezing water. Okay, okay, we'll do it over here. No shakalaka, no water. And so the ground's just wet, so and God's probably like, oh, hi, these kids, oi, oi, ve. you know, it's just these kids, you know, and he's probably thinking, oh, I can't wait for Gideon to grow up, to grow up. And so we see later on in the story, Frank, we don't see the fleece anymore. We don't see him pull it out anymore. He did twice. But thank God later on we don't see that. We don't see, okay, God, got another question for you. Pulls out the sweater or the fleece, whatever, pulls it out. We don't see that because we, he found out that advancement comes through maturity. Maturity. It comes through maturity. Advancement also comes through humility. It comes through humility. See, God anointed Gideon as uh, in the sense of he was able to call some warriors because he said, I'm gonna, you're going to save um, the people of Israel. You're going to save them. And he was like, I don't know how to do this. And, and there was an anointing that came over him when he began to recruit. I mean, so much to the point that over 32,000 men came to the call. When he's, you know, just blowing the horn and, you know, I have an announcement. You know, we're looking for guys, looking for guys. Come on, we need some men, some warriors. Uh, we, need some, uh, 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 uh. we need some people to come and be a part of the army. 32,000 people show up. And Gideon's like, all right, God was right. We can do this. 32,000, come on. Who can't do this? And so, um, but look what God said. God stepped in. He said, that's awesome. That's wonderful. You got 32,000 men. And Judges 7-2 says, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Hmm. Kind of makes you wonder if that's why God puts a squeeze on things in our lives sometimes because you know, you're praying to hit the lottery, and God's knocking off that one number that you never win because he's thinking if you win it, you'll have no use for me. Or maybe you're really praying for that promotion, and 
year after year that you don't seem to get it and you don't understand why. Maybe God is waiting for you to get some maturity and some humility in your life and you're not ready for that position yet. I I don't know what it is and I I don't know why God does some things sometimes, but he has his reasons because he wants to make sure that you still need him. I still need you, God. You know, I, I can't do this on my own and even if we had all the finances and all that, I still need you. This was what he was telling Gideon. You got too many men. Because remember, Gideon wasn't too sure of himself in the beginning, and so maybe these, this is what still Gideon was working through, and God realized it and knew it because God knows the intents of our heart. And he's saying, you got too many men, Gideon. You know, I need you to kind of cut it down because I still want you to need me. So God told Gideon, I want you to go ask all these guys. Who's scared of the Midianites? If you're scared of the Midianites, go home. 22,000 men (laughs) said they were scared. And Gideon said, no hard feelings, go home. If you're scared to fight, just go on home. So 32,000 dropped down to 10,000 with one question. And God still said, You've got too many. Because I believe with 10,000, you could still take it into your own hands and say, you did it. Cut the numbers down some more. And so Gideon was like, all right, what do you, what do you want me to do? He said, get your 10,000 guys together and tell them to take a break and go get some water. So there's a stream, there's a river running through. And so um, they went and said, all right, guys, get a drink. Let's take a break. And God was like, watch them. So Gideon stands back, and he's just kind of observing. And we've got a bunch of men just dunking their heads in the river, just just slurping it all up. Just, I ain't got long of a break. And then you got the other guys that are cupping it with their hands and drinking and looking around. God says, everyone that dunked their heads in the river, send them home. I need some people that are alert. I need some people that won't allow the enemy to sneak up behind them. I need men, warriors, that have advanced and know what they're doing. And so he says, all right, guys, everybody that dunked their heads, y'all can go home. And they're like, I I dunked my head, man. And so they went home, you know. Left them with 300 guys. From 32,000 men all the way down to 300 hand suckers. That sucked the water out of their hands. 300. Now, God knew this was perfect number. There's no way that anybody could look back and say the victory was all them with 300 guys. Because we're talking about thousands of Midianites. We're talking about thousands of people. And so God had to bring him to a humble state of realizing that advancement comes through humility. It doesn't come through numbers. It doesn't come through everything that you have. It doesn't come through, advancement doesn't come through mere, uh, mere, uh, materialistic things. It doesn't come through how much wealth you have. It doesn't, come, it doesn't come by the position that you hold. Advancement, my gosh, I could tell you of some people that work at a high position and their employees have more integrity than they do because it's not about position. It's about humility. C.S. Lewis once said this, Humility is not about thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's not about what can I get. It's about what can we do for you. You know, I, I come in this place every Sunday not to put the spotlight on me, even though, you know, we, we film and we do all this. It's what can I God, what do you want to say through me to impact them? You know, and, and I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I get a little discouraged when the numbers are down a little bit, not because we can say, oh, look how many we had, but, man, so we can say, look how many people are being ministered to. I don't want anybody to miss the word. I don't want anybody to miss what God has to say for their lives because it could be the very thing to encourage them to advance and grow. 
That's why we have the app. That's why we have the website. Because if you miss Sunday, back in the day when you miss Sunday, you miss Sunday. Amen? Y'all remember those days? You know, and the, the pastor would always get up there. If you missed it, oh, you missed it. Tough luck. Now you can go and you can watch it. Get the word in you. It's not about you. It's about others. It's about what God wants to do. Zechariah 4.6 said this, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You will succeed because of my spirit, though you are few and weak. Could it be that God knew exactly you know, about Gideon, knew exactly the way he felt back then to put it in, in the heart of Zechariah to write this, that you know, even though you're few and weak, you can succeed. Even though you feel that you're lowest and you're least and you're weakest, that's when I'm the strongest and that's when you need me the most. And I believe that's why God does what he does a lot of times because like I said a while ago, he wants to know that you still need him and there's no reason for his strength if you're not weak. There, there has to be a trade-off, just like the name of our church, the Exchange Worship Center. You know, I love when people come up to them and say, I know exactly why you called it the Exchange. And they're usually right because the Christian walk, is, it's, it's an exchange. Every day, it's an exchange. God, I, tra- I exchange my weakness for your strength. God, I come to an altar and I exchange my life for yours. God, I, I need an exchange because within myself, I've got nothing. But I know that you have everything. Can we please swap? Can we exchange some things? And where most people will say that's not a fair trade, God himself says, I'll take all you've got and I'll give you everything I have. That's why my son went to the cross, to make that exchange, to give you advancement. Because there's nothing or anyone in this world that wants to see you advance and succeed more than God himself. He created us for advancement. He created us to succeed. It's us that allow things to come into our lives to keep us from advancing and going backwards. But God says, what can I do to get rid of those things? And are you willing to let go of those things in order to advance and go forward? See, because advancement doesn't only come through maturity. As Gideon was learning, the maturity of I can put the fleece away and I can just trust in your word. But advancement also came through the humility of realizing that I can't do it on my own no matter what I achieve and no matter what I have I've got to have God on my side and he's the one that will bring me through it but he was also learning that advancement comes through brokenness it comes through brokenness of revealing our what's within the very things that others can't see that God is looking for to break us to the place of saying, God, I need you more than ever. And you're not afraid to admit it. See, when we're not broken, we put up this facade of I can handle this and I can do this and and, and don't, no, I don't need anybody else telling me what to do. I am a man or I am a woman. I could do this on my own. But when we get to the place of being broken, then we can not only turn to God, but we can turn to others. And I love what was said so many times at the men's thing this weekend was that we can be vulnerable to another man or a woman can be vulnerable to another woman, that we find somebody, that we have somebody in our life that you can call at 2 a.m. in the morning. It's not always the pastor, so please don't everybody in this church call me at 2 a.m. You know, find somebody that you can trust. Find somebody that you can turn to. Find somebody that you can reveal some things to, and you know that it won't go around the church and and, and gossip about you, but you know that they'll be praying for you. That takes a state of brokenness when you're able to do that with somebody else. So Gideon, at this time, you know, God was saying, okay, you've got enough men. You've got 300 guys. I want you to plan your attack. Here's what I want you to do, but I need you to advance with it. I need you to go forward. And so God sent him and some others to go sneak into the camp of the enemy. And so we find them, uh, you know, taking this little journey to where the enemy is. It's nighttime. Everybody's asleep. 
and uh, they kind of sneak up on one of these tents or, or uh, behind a tree, wherever they were at, but they started to hear one of the soldiers talking to one of his friends. You know, you're on night duty. You know, some of you people that might work at night, you know, the, the work's not always maybe the busiest, so you're jabbering, you're talking. And, and so this, this was uh, what was going on. These two soldiers were talking, and Gideon and, and the guys were listening in. And so one of the soldiers started talking to the other one and saying, man, I had this dream last night. He says, really, what was the dream? And he started to lay out this whole dream about how this, uh, uh, how their, their camp was crushed and, and, and how Gideon prevailed and, you know, all this different stuff. And, th- and they made this statement. They said, the Lord must truly be with Gideon. And that's all Gideon needed to hear. He knew now was the time to strike. Because everybody, the, 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 the dream, I'm sure, began to float through the, uh, through the camp to the other guards. And, man, oh, so, so in, uh, intimidation started setting in. All the things we talked about last Sunday, you know, that, that we say we shouldn't have, started to flow through their camp. Intimidation and complaining and whining and crying and all these different things. And so now they're getting nervous. Can I ask you, if you were able to sneak into the enemy's camp, what would the enemy be saying about you? Would they be complaining that God has anointed you? Would would they be complaining that they know in the morning you're going to crush them? What would they be saying about you? Or would you overhear the, the enemy talking to each other saying they're not a threat, they're not a problem, they can't advance, they're very weak, they're at their least, I don't think we have to worry about them. We could hit snooze in the morning because they won't attack. Are you hearing something different? Are you hearing what Gideon heard that allowed him to say it's time to strike now? What's the enemy saying about you? Are they so scared because you are anointed and they know it? That even in their own dreams, in their own vision, they see that you, as a man of God or a woman of God, is about to crush them. Hmm. What are they saying? So look at this. Judges seven sixteen. Gideon's ready to attack. He's ready to hand out the weapons. The weapons. You would think some big swords and some Uzis and take everybody down and we're going to, you know, just hand them all out and, you know, it's just going to be an awesome massacre. So he divided the 300 men into three groups and gave each man their weapons. He handed them a ram's horn, a clay jar that had a torch in it. He said, guys, you ready? You know, some of them were like, um, <laughs> can I get a, you know, you know, something, you know, something, something, a horn, <laughs> you know, clay jar with a torch in it. Really? Is this it? And then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, just do as I do. Just do as I do. And as soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horn, blow your horns too all around the entire camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. For the Lord and for Gideon. When you see me do what I do, do as I did. When you don't know what to do in life, my gosh, would you find somebody in your church or in your family that follows God? If you don't have the answer and you don't know what to do, would you just do as they do? If they're following God and they're seeing results and they have advancement, if they have some growth in their life for the things of God, would you just do as they do until you learn how to stand on your own feet, until you learn that you don't have to put the fleece out anymore, until you learn that when God says do it, do it, whatever it is. Gideon says, just do as I do. I know you don't understand it right now. I know it's kind of complicated. I know you're wondering where your sword is and your gun is and all these. I know you where the weapon's at and all you got is a horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. Just do as I do. Have faith and know that God is going to be victorious. And so they began to surround the camp and, and he broke the, the pitcher and 
He brought out the torch, and, and chaos began to happen. Look at this. Charles Stanley once said this, Dr. Charles Stanley. Brokenness is God's requirement for maximum usefulness. You have to be broken in order to wholly be used. And I know that's kind of an oxymoron, and it's, it's, it doesn't make sense because a lot of times you know, something is most useful when it's working at its best. But God says it's when you're broken, I can use you the most. There was an um, evangelist years and years ago by the name of Dr. Mickey Bonner. Remember Larry? Me and Larry, uh, Dr. Mickey Bonner was very good friends with um, our, our former pastor, Pastor Jerry Vestal. And uh, me and Larry, uh, how many hours were we up there filming him? For three days, three days straight, we didn't sleep or eat, and no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but but um, we we had Dr. Mickey Bonner come to the church, and he was putting together a video series, and and uh, me and Larry filmed him for three days, filming uh, footage for his uh, for his video series, and so he was a really nice guy. He was an older gentleman, but he had some truth in him, and um, years ago, it was about twenty. 21 years ago, he passed away, and um, he was at a big men's event. I mean, thousands of men are at this event, and he was at the pulpit. They filmed it, and um, it, you, you could probably find it on YouTube or something, but they kind of faded it out at his death, but he was in the pulpit, and one of the last things he said was that uh, in order to have the mind of Christ, you have to reach true brokenness. And he slumped over on the pulpit and died on the stage. But that was the last thing he said, which that, that we have to be broken. Because brokenness is so important. Because without brokenness, we have too much of a wall. We, we have too much holding everything in. We have to be broken uh, before God. And one of the most interesting things about Dr. Bonner was before he went out on stage to speak, this had nothing to do with the message. I just think this was awesome. They tried to put TV makeup on him, you know, because they were filming. It was a big, big thing. And he said, I don't want any makeup. I don't want to stand before the Lord with this junk on my face. And that's when he died. It's crazy, right? But he died talking about brokenness. Brokenness is so important. Second Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, Let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. See, when Gideon smashed he, he smashed the, the, the clay jar and the torch was in it and all, everybody else did that. It was the clay jar that was concealing the light so the enemy could not see them. But once it was broken, the light was there for all to see. And it was the light of 300 men surrounding this camp that caused such chaos and the horns being blown because they had one horn in, in one hand, they had a horn in one hand and a torch in the other. And so these guys are waking up out of a dead sleep and all they see is fire and light all around them, the sounds of the horns blasting. So they began to be confused and fight amongst themselves, killing each other. There's something about releasing the light releasing what God has put it within you. It causes confusion in the camp of the enemy. Just like we talked about Goliath, and every time he shouted and every time he came before the people, it says they froze in fear and they'd run off and confused. They'd just run and they wouldn't do anything. But when David stepped up and said, how dare you, it caused confusion in the mind of Goliath because this was not the normal response. Many Christians today, when adversity comes, we run in fear and we still conceal our light. But if we would get to the place of brokenness to reveal what's within us, you will put confusion within the camp and the things that the enemy is trying to come against you with cannot prevail. Because now you're standing in the glory of God. You're standing with the light of God that's within you to be able to express what God wants to do with you and man, so much can come from that. So much advancement can come from allowing God to use you the way he wants to use you. But if we're constantly concealing, 
How will we ever touch anybody? How will we ever advance? Because all we'll ever do is pull out the fleece. When God's saying, pull out the light. Trust me. Know that what I'm asking you to do is for the very glory of God. It's for the kingdom, and it's for advancement in your life. But if we never get to the place of having total trust and faith in God, saying, God, I'm not asking you why. Just ask me.